Hans Jakob Wagner ist wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter am, äh, am ICD und hat einen besonderen Fo äh, Fokus auf fortschrittliche computergestützte Holzbausysteme und damit verbunden äh, die robotergestützte Produktionssysteme und Prozesse. Jakob erhielt ähm, einen Bachelor of Science in Architektur von der Technischen Universität in Wien. Schloss an, anschließend hier in Stuttgart das itech masterstudium ähm, an der Universität Stuttgart ab mit Al Auszeichnung und das im Jahr äh, 2017. Während seines Studiums arbeitete er immer wieder bei renommierten Architekturbüros in Wien und in Paris äh, sowie an der Technischen Universität in Wien und an der Universität in Stuttgart. Jetzt aktuell arbeitet er an seiner Dissertation mit dem Titel Project Based Robotic Timber Construction. The Framework for Integrative Co-Evolution of Building and Automating Systems in Computational and Wood Construction. And yeah, with that, um, Jakob, you have the word and I'm happy you are here and um, give a le lecture to us. Thank you. Great, and I'm sorry for um, jumping in a bit late. Um, you were on time. I was just arriving from Uh, from Weiblingen, and there was a huge congestion in Stuttgart. Okay. Um, I guess I should share my screen quickly. Uh, I have the slides also here. If it's uh, if that should be a problem. And I could click, but Thanks. in case you have it, it would be better, I think. Yeah. You see it? You see it. Yes, great. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak um, about uh, the research uh, I'm doing and uh, in, in a lot of the cases that I'm going to show uh, that we are doing here in Stuttgart. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna focus in in this presentation a bit around the, the the research question that are mostly relevant for for my um, hopefully soon to be finished uh, dissertation. Um, but uh, this is of course connected to a couple of uh, research projects that are uh, that that were and are being done here uh, at the ICB with a lot of other. Uh, people at the university and also outside of the university. And um, my focus in, in or my, my, my main question that I want to, to pose is, is the question of automation in architecture. And um, I want to propose a framework for project-based robotic timber construction, um, which is the kind of epitome of flexible automation in architecture. And it comes um, to sum up the presentation before I even start. It, it comes with the, with, let's say the attitude, right? That's of course more a political attitude, I guess, but, uh, but I think it's really important for also for the research, but it comes with an attitude that it might be easier to develop um, Automation technologies um, uh, further with a specific goal of project based automation rather than completely restructuring the whole construction industry towards a product based automation, uh, which, which is, of course, the standard view on how um, robotic fabrication might be actually might actually work um, in, a, in, let's say, the industrial setting. And um, for project-based automation, we are really trying to figure out how we can reconfigure both our software automation parts, but also the robotic automation parts uh, so rapidly that we can really do one project after the other using the robotic technologies, but uh, not being uh, restricted by the technology. Um, and um, yeah, before I start completely, um, I 
think actually I think Moritz already uh, introduced everything here. This is this is the iTech master class that I was happily a, a big part of, and I did a couple of um, smaller research pr projects during my during my uh, studies, um, but I gradually trans transitioned. Uh, very very directly to to timber construction um, even though i i did a lot of stuff also um, with fiber systems and with cyber physical production systems we had the drone pavilion uh, that we did in 2016 and 17 um, and um, this is kind of my focus um, between the material systems and the, and the robotic fabrication but uh, to the to the topic at hand, um, the the real question that we that we often do not ask, even though we even though though we do a lot of um, digital technologies and a, a lot of um, robotic fabrication, we don't ask a lot of times what automation in architecture um, actually is. And um, even though it might sound trivial, um, I think it's actually a very complicated question. Because the way that automation is uh, currently understood is coming from a different industry, as we know, it's, it's coming from manufacturing and it's coming uh, from a notion of uh, mass production. And in, in architecture, uh, we tried now for more than a century to, to really um, include the notion of mass production and serial building. Um, but it, uh, it frankly never, never really took off and it never really worked. And uh, I guess um, the, my hypothesis is that the, the industry is just coming with very different boundary conditions and the way automation works in other, in other industries is really not how it even can work in, in architecture. Um, and uh, that, of course, leads us to the question of what it could be in architecture. So how could we develop and guide the technological um, development towards the point of, of, uh, of, the, of the development where it's really um, applicable in a broad sense in, in architecture? And um, I think my, my main hypothesis is that um, the developmental path of um, of this of, of the of the construction industry is completely different uh, from manufacturing. Um, so in in manufacturing, we came from arguably maybe we came from up here, which is craft production. So you have craftsmen that are uh, very flexible. They know what they need to do. They can have a kind of overview over the whole process. And they can do like various kind of uh, products or uh, uh, artifacts. Um, but then, of course, in the 19th century, with the start of mass producing and, uh, and the assembly line, of course, we drastically limited uh, the capabilities of manufacturing in terms of flexibility, but had a, had the, the economies of scales kick in, of course, and these kind of economies of scale afforded a certain automation level, right? So you could think about building a machine that produces your product uh, fully automated um, uh, with the backdrop that, uh, that it's the same product every time. And um, manufacturing, of course, now is trying to move into a more flexible um, scenario, which you could call broadly flexible automation. Um, I think Industry 4.0 is a precursor to that, um, but, uh, but it's really trying to mass customize something that is completely standardized. Now in construction, even though mass customization is a big term also here, um, and, and often is, is claimed to be like an enabler in, in construction, um, I think the principle of mass customization, of course, uh, is dependent on something that is standardized in the first place, right? And in construction, we don't have that. Um, we, we have a project with, with not only each project looking, uh, being unique in terms of its materialization, 
but especially also each project having a different client, each project having a different planning team, having different boundary conditions. And um, so far, uh, there is no, no way that we could automate that. And um, therefore, the, 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 the developmental path of construction was, of course, very different, where arguably we're still very much based in craft production. And instead of increasing the flexibility, we want to basically remain the flexibility, but increase the automation level. Um, ideally, that brings us to a kind of very similar uh, point of uh, point in, in terms of the technological um, systems. But it's very important to understand that we're coming from very different kind of uh, uh, origins. And um, to speak a bit more about the, the differentiation between a project and a product. Um, I think in architecture, we really um, start every every building project uh, from a tabula rasa, and uh, this is this is typically um, very very harshly criticized by manufacturing kind of point of views, and it's it's claimed that this uh, brings a lot of inefficiencies into the realization of the project. Um, but I would argue that it's also uh, bringing a lot of optimization potential because the building therefore can of course respond to all the local boundary conditions. Um, and, uh, and also um, if you think about the, the volume of a building project, uh, you, have, you have a local production network that actually needs to produce your, uh, your structure. Um, so you have both uh, a local site, a local team, and you have a local production network, and you need to develop your project from scratch. And um, this table here shows how we believe that um, even though you have a, a certain kind of uh, 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 kind of project-based approach to this this automation regime, you can still reuse technologies and make, make use of uh, economies of scale, but um, the part that is scaled in terms of uh, re repetition is not the product, is not the, the component, but it's actually the, the task and the skill. Um, and um, what do we mean with that? The task is basically the representation of a process step that uh, needs to be done in order for a project to uh, to be uh, built. And the skill is the respective um, capacity to actually um, um, do this process. And um, arguably um, putting a screw into a beam is, uh, is always the same kind of uh, procedure. And um, this, is, this is where we want to anchor our standardization effort towards um, to play free the design capacity of our buildings, right? So even though we're always using the same uh, kind of processes, um, this, the same like uh, small processes, uh, we're, 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 um, we're going to be free from any kind of uh, design limitations. And um, to showcase that, um, uh, in our in the last years, um, I developed together with a lot of partners a transportable robotic platform that can unfold in different uh, uh, conditions and environments to build completely different uh, building systems, but always based on the same uh, task and skill um, processes that are um, fundamentally the same in each of these projects, even though, of course, um, then the final product is something very unique and something um, that you couldn't, couldn't claim is, is a standardized. Uh, uh, um, and um, to think this idea even further, um, this, this notion or this kind of attitude, as I, as I said before, is very much linked also to 
uh, a kind of environment that uh, that I envision for for the construction industry, in which the term of the, the idea of integrating the building system with the automation system or with the fabrication um, processes is not a one term a one time coupling but it's something that happens continuously over time so i call this integrative coevolution and basically it just means that um, across time you can always reintegrate and evolve um, in both fields right so instead of claiming we have now found the perfect building system for multi-story timber structures and we integrated together with the fabrication um, approach and this is basically the end of the line and we now do this for 20 years um, i'm proposing an environment in which this integration can happen but still both of the both um, domains can further evolve right so you can further develop your building system and you can also further develop your for example robotic fabrication system um, so now that that was a lot of theory <laughs> or concept um, concept based uh, talking and um, I, I just want to quickly run through a couple of slides of, of what what this means in terms of uh, um, of, of buildings right and how we can actually uh, see uh, this kind of uh, concept and framework already being embedded in, in a couple of the demonstrators that we did lately. Um, and uh, the first project I want to talk about is the, is the Buga Wood Pavilion, which I guess uh, most of you know. So I will just in terms of the time, I will try to uh, basically just mention the, the main points. It's a segmented timber shell structure. It was constructed on the summer island in Heilbronn. And, and that's the interesting part for, for this kind of lecture here. It is basically the direct further development from the Lager Exhibition Pavilion in 2014, which is also a segmented shell. Um, but uh, in, the, in a couple of ways uh, is, is the predecessor and in the Buga uh, Wood Pavilion, we tried to push the building system uh, further and to develop it further. And how does it look like? So the Bundesgartenschau, uh, the Landesgartenschau 2014 had a footprint that was, of course, uh, uh, much smaller. Um, but uh, for the structural system, the main, the main argument is that the Buga system needed to span three times further. Um, it's four times bigger. And what we tried to do is to use the same amount of material per square meter um, as we had in the Landesgartenschau Pavilion, um, which is, of course, a, a drastic uh, in, increase in performance. Um, and how do, we, how do we achieve that? Um, instead of building the shell out of uh, solid segments, we split the segments and we build a hollow cassette, which means we increase the um, construction height uh, with the same material. Um, this, of course, um, comes with a certain tectonic complexity. Um, that, in turn, is only um, realizable with robotic fabrication and not only uh, CNC manufacturing, but also additive, uh, additive um, um, fabrication steps. And um, of course, um, we also have uh, uh, an increased uh, planning complexity. So we have three times the performance, but we have eight times the complexity in terms of number of parts. Um, in this project, we had almost 400 different cassettes, each of them unique. And um, the beams and plates are um, around eight times the amount because um, depending on how many um, edges each cassette had, uh, we had uh, between five and six or seven beams uh, per segment. And this is, of course, a complexity that can only be rendered feasible if we really think the digital generation of the geometrical data 
um, in coherence with the materialization uh, through robotic fabrication. And it's also rather, it's of course rather a complex uh, fabrication procedure, which, or we could also call it comprehensive, right? Because it, it includes a lot of typical tasks that are common within the, within the timber construction um, um, craft, but it translates them to a robotic uh, fabrication procedure. Um, and these kind of procedures, we try to embed already as certain data modules in the, in the um, computationally derived uh, building data model. And um, by doing so, we could then directly translate the computational design information into robotic uh, fabrication um, steps. And here you can see the, the automated production of these, uh, these cassettes where we apply glue, then we put the, uh, we put the beams, and we fix those beams with, uh, with nails. Then we apply glue again, and we put the top cassettes. And this process typically took around only five minutes, and really, um, really showcased also to our um, partner, uh, Blumer, uh, not Blumer Leben, <laughs> Müller Blasstein Holzbauwerke in, uh, in Kloster Ulm, how effective and how fast this kind of automation can actually happen, even if each of those pieces is uh, unique in shape. We also had the subtractive manufacturing afterwards with the uh, final formatting of the, of the cassettes, uh, which of course was highly important for uh, the modules to fit together um, during the assembly. Um, yeah, these are some impressions of the final pavilion. This was a party that I was not invited to, but uh, we were still very happy that, uh, that it happened. <laughs> and um, um, yes. That being said, um, in, in the industry, of course, um, we still see a lot of projects that look more like this, um, which, means um, that there is still a lot of transfer to be ha to happen. And uh, the question how we can bring these digital technologies into the industry is really of a fundamental nature. And it's, it's really also a novel question that so far we didn't ask so often, right? Um, so far in, in our research field, we concentrated around the possibilities of these new technologies. So the question was rather, what can we do? And um, the question was not, how can that be embedded within the context of the existing industry? How can it be embedded within an industry that has certain skills, certain craft, um, but also a lot of organizational frameworks that uh, these technologies need to align with? And um, if you look at the industry, of course, there is a, a notion of disintegration. Um, so it's, it's basically the opposite of uh, what we are trying to achieve here, or what I'm trying to achieve with, with this kind of uh, uh, research. Um, and it comes from the, of course, from the division of work, right? There is a architect, there is a construction company. And um, because they're fairly seldomly doing uh, projects together across a longer period, um, there is a, a very little feedback uh, between those two parties. If you look at it from a, let's say, overview, so the architects are fairly disintegrated from the construction companies. We know this uh, also leads to a lot of problems in construction. Um, and, uh, and of course, we all want to, we all want to change this. Um, and this leads, of course, to the question how we can, how we can integrate this and specifically not how we can integrate this in, in a research context, which we did now for 10 years. We did a lot of pavilions. We did a lot of uh, showcases of what the technologies can really do. But uh, I think the next question is how can we integrate this in the industry? And um, 
I kind of gave a hint already before the common the common answer to the question of how this integration can happen is that we transform the industry from a project based uh, discipline or from a project based environment to a product based environment and I see this highly uh, critical and uh, I really don't believe it's going to work in a, in a large scale. Um, to be a bit more, uh, to differentiate a bit more, um, of course it can work for a specific niche applications, for example, for modular timber construction, there's a certain sweet spot where actually it might, it might work, right? But, um, but uh, of course, it also reminds us back to, um, to the big standardization efforts that we uh, under, underwent or that construction underwent in the, in the last century. Um, and even though we, had, we found kind of new terminology to describe the same thing, um, it, from, a, from a design point of view, it is fairly, fairly much the same. And um, this is this is of course what uh, um, what a lot of the a lot of the ideas that are floating around and a lot of the startups uh, that uh, are forming at the moment uh, take as a as a kind of uh, jumping board. Um, and uh, I think it's I think it's okay. I think there is a potential that this kind of approach will work. But it's only going to work for a very small section of the market, right? Which is still a, a big business, right? And uh, um, especially with our partners from Cate uh, from Copios here, um, I think this is a, a, a clearly a, a great idea to do. But uh, but I think in research we have the uh, responsibility to also include um, into our calculation what happens with all the other uh, buildings that are too specific, that they can be um, um, effectively uh, standardized. And the reason why they can be standardized is because they have a unique setting, a unique boundary condition that is defined by their local context. Um, they're mostly project-based, uh, sitting in a project-based organizational framework. There's one client, one company, that wants to build a certain project and they might do it once in their lifetime, right? Um, the projects are fairly complex in a lot of ways. Um, we are speaking of multi-use inner city development um, that have a lot of um, targets to achieve. And in a lot of ways, and this is, a, this is an aspect that we should not and cannot um, forget if you're talking about automation, um, is of course the socio-cultural importance and responsibility that architecture has. Um, the question how we want to live as a society is, is in the end a very social one. It's it's not it's not something that can be answered. It's not a question that can be answered by technology. It can only be answered by people and um, the the answer of what we do out of out of these goals that are set from the social cultural context uh, can be aided and augmented with the uh, automation. Um, anyways, in this modular um, kind of construction and prefabrication paradigm, we have a certain integration between the building systems and the automation uh, and the automation system, but it's of course very much constrained. Um, it's, it's very much building system specific, the machines that are employed, the machines that are location dependent, and they're always limited in transportation size. And um, even though we achieve uh, integrate, uh, integrated uh, design, the things both fabrication and design at the same time, um, we can see that the companies that have, a, let's say, a fairly good building system, uh, mostly pre, uh, prefab housing companies, that they have a very big, uh, um, a very hard time to actually uh, change their building system. For example, if there's new, a new building regulation 
or if if the if there is a um, if there is a, a customer that wants to build that specific building system in a different context, right? With with different if if there is higher snow loads, higher wind loads, uh, most of these systems can't really deal with with the adaptations that would be necessary, even though it might be very small uh, adjustments that are actually uh, needed. Um, the companies then can't really um, break free from their um, what I call discrete integration lock-in. And um, um, how, how are we doing, doing in terms of time? I don't want to overrun. I think you can continue. Moritz, Julia? Yeah, Moritz, you are uh, muted. Sorry, I was unmuted. Yeah, you can go on. So we have some questions, but how much, take how your much time. Do I have? Sorry? How much longer do I have? 15 minutes, if you ask. 15? Okay, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, okay, so by by looking at um, how how prefab automation is run, um, we also of course need to look at what what kind of technologies and frameworks already exist in manufacturing. As I mentioned before, manufacturing is trying to become more flexible um, every year, and um, and the main concept is going from a functional factory to more distributed production networks. Um, which can really um, uh, quickly respond to different uh, uh, different uh, needs in the market. Um, and as I explained already, um, this is possibly the state of technology where really for the first time in the development of humanity, um, also automation can be broadly applied to construction because we need this flexibility um, more than anything. Um, what I think is uh, very um, dangerous though, is if, as an, if we as an industry in construction um, change our development path down to a standardized uh, production uh, modality, um, because we are basically um, trying to repeat what automation is doing and we try to approach construction in such organizational frameworks already for uh, for a lot of times in in the in the last century and uh, frankly it, it there is like very limited uh, success stories to tell about this uh, about this approach um, one big aspect uh, about how this flexibility can work is that we have uh, not only uh, a reconfigurable uh, robotic fabrication infrastructure, but it's also transportable. This means with very low resources, we can bring this uh, platform uh, to a local um, manufacturing or uh, construction uh, company. It can unfold uh, at site and uh, also integrate itself to the local uh, fabrication um, environment. Um, this is how that transformation looks like. And um, with the team platform, we basically did a tour already across all of Germany. And um, now we, we actually got also new platforms that we are going to continue this, uh, this model with. Um, another aspect that is uh, very important if we if we talk about this um, this uh, flexibility in automation um, is of course the digital workflows and the digital um, software organization that we use to actually program and program our robots but also generate our design geometry and um, the diagram on the on the slide now shows how we did that actually for, for the Buga Wood Pavilion, where we had a computational model that 
um, was directly linked to the fabrication setup. Um, and uh, we transferred, after finishing the design, we transferred all the geometry, the, all the data out of the computational model into the fabrication simulation, where then we generated uh, all the control code. And the control code was structured in a way that, um, that in, uh, in a way where we built a database of robotic skills. So these were, uh, in principle, very small subroutines that were um, parametrized, but uh, uh, reusable across all, all cassettes. And most importantly, they were also indifferent of the Buga cassettes um, as such. So the same subroutines you would um, also uh, use in later projects um, as, as we are gonna show later. And, um, and using these subroutines, basically the control code of each of those uh, cassettes uh, was fairly simple. It basically just said, okay, pick the beam from location there and there, um, put it in this location, um, apply the glue in this and this location. So it was basically more like a, a kind of very simple instruction that we, that we were then able to generate. And um, by using the same subroutines that we used in the, in the production of the, of the Buga shell, uh, we transferred the same principle to uh, two other projects um, where then we were able to rather quickly um, program the automation of two different uh, building systems. Um, and the, the first or the second um, of these kind of demonstrators was a fairly small fair stand um, that, uh, that we built together with a BC. And um, it's really a, a fairly simple um, pick and place routine but it uses the same skills uh, that we used in the Buga pavilion uh, with the picking routine and the nailing routine. And by that is able to build a completely bespoke um, structure that of course was designed not in the sense that we took the Buga cassettes and thought like, okay, how can we transform it? But rather it was designed from scratch, right? We thought like, okay, what kind of structure do we want and how should it look like? And, um, and then we built it uh, using the robots, but use the same underlying standardized uh, routines. And um, in the excellence cluster, we try now to also apply the same routines and the same processes uh, to multi-story timber construction, um, where of course, we have a lot of potential to increase the design freedom from very rigid uh, structures um, to what we see as a motivation, um, more free slab structures as we, as we know them from concrete. Um, this is, of course, um, caused by the uh, linearity of timber. Uh, timber is an anisotropic uh, uh, fibrous material uh, wants to span in one direction, especially if all the modules that we produce are based on transportation limitations. Um, and we see that in the in the in concrete, we actually have much more freedom in terms of the um, slab outlines and the shape. And we developed a couple of uh, building systems that might address this uh, limitation in timber construction and really bring timber from a unidirectional system to a multidirectional system. And what is important to say that even the CLT um, is of course mainly unidirectional or bidirectional in its performance spectrum. And um, what is of course very interesting in this case is that we're working alongside a lot of different disciplines to really think this uh, integrative uh, uh, notion further, um, and my role in this uh, this uh, case is within the 
development, both in the development of the building system in RP3 and in the development of the cyber physical uh, robotic fabrication platform in RP4. And um, the last project that I that I wanted to show um, very briefly is the IP Campus Lab, which is a kind of predecessor of what we tried to build for the within the LCRL building. And um, it's a, slab, a point supported timber slab with multi directional um, performance uh, spectra. And um, it's designed uh, in, a, in a philosophy of mono material. Uh, building system, so we try to avoid any steel detailing, um, which you can see we failed at the, at the, at the foundation, but that's a, <laughs> that's a different story. Um, by doing so, we try to um, achieve a very uh, performative and lightweight uh, material efficient uh, building system, which is, of course, uh, tightly interconnected with the structural simulation. Um, and um, increases the complexity of the slab uh, tectonics to a point where we can only efficiently produce it using uh, the robotic fabrication platforms that, um, that of course, I, I mentioned already. And this is how the production was looking like. Um, it's basically uh, mostly a, also an additive assembly process with uh, reinforcement webs being glued into a slab uh, with two um, CLT plates. And it involves, uh, again, the same routines that we used uh, for the Bugerwood Pavilion already, um, but for a completely different building system. And yeah, we are currently working on this uh, system to be applied in the, in the LCRL demonstrator. As a, as a very uh, performative um, slab um, for the office parts. Uh, we tried to achieve um, uh, around 10 meter spans and not only in one direction, but basically in any direction. And by doing so, we can, of course, break free from all um, limitations in the floor plan design. And especially we can, um, we can make sure that the building is also usable um, if there is a ch even if there is a change of use. You can design the floor plan after 20 years, 30 years um, from scratch. And the only thing that you need to be aware of is, is this sparsely um, located uh, column points. Um, yeah, so a quick conclusion. Um, I'm trying to um, formulate the theoretical backbone of what I hope is the is the is the development of uh, automation technologies in construction during the next decade. Hopefully, um, it's of course completely out of the scope that I can provide um, uh, the, the technology to be uh, to do so. Um, rather, I, I want to provide uh, convincing um, theoretical contextualization and conceptualization of this project based uh, uh, robotic uh, timber construction um, framework. And of course, um, I think we were able to show that a, cert a certain number of the assumptions and hypotheses that we, that we um, formulated in terms of the reusability of the technology, even though there is completely different building systems and uh, project boundary conditions in play um, with the three different projects uh, that, uh, that I talked about. And um, yeah, hopefully by doing so, we can achieve a, a integrative co-evolution of both the building system developments and the automation system developments. Um, and I think we can both agree that both of those domains need a lot of, a lot of research and a, a lot of innovation to answer all the challenges that we have uh, in the construction industry.
And yeah, this is an outlook of uh, how the how the platform got a lot of new kits. Basically, um, we have two new um, timber uh, platforms um, in Weiblingen at the moment. Uh, the big one is currently being transported, like it's, it's gonna be transported to Müller Blaustein timber construction at uh, on Monday, and um, and. Uh, we are gonna use those platforms also for the production of the of the LCOL demonstrator, of course. Um, yeah, with that, um, I come to a close and uh, want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, danke, Jakob. Um... Genau, Klatschen habe ich vorhin bei Katrin vergessen, war natürlich Klatsche zu beide, also ja, um, yeah, thank you all and yeah, do, do we have some question? Is anybody who wants to ask something about um, this approach? No, sign it. We are we are so uh, we are small group so <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> but okay, um, I I try to start maybe um, with one question. So, um, Katrin, ah, okay. Glaube ich, Katrin, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, Vielleicht okay, Kat Katrin first. Katrin first. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Katrin first. Yeah, thank you, Jakob, for your presentation. It's very very nice. I see it for the first time, and. Uh, I just wanted to say that, um, I mean, I, I kind of agree uh, because I'm coming from the kind of super customized background as in complex geometry and design. And now I find myself in a, in a company that is seeing um, architecture as a product. Uh, of course, um, I see your argument, but I, I would, um, I do wonder, um, for instance, the, the definition of product approach, uh, because um, in, for instance, in Gropius, where I'm now in, um, product starts, uh, is this, it's always a question who's a, who's a client of that product. And in Gropius, it is actually the end user. And uh, so uh, saying that, um, at the heart is a is a is a final use and what this um what this user uh, needs and that of course um there is a question uh, is there a pattern in what uh, this uh, the the tenant like the person who's living there the human uh, needs or you know what is a what is what is a wish list so to say and i think that is a great opportunity of making it a product um uh you know, the uh, product based approach um, where you have the user at the center to, to iterate, like to give you reasoning for what you're doing. And the question is, um, I mean, where, you know, in, in the project I, um, I showed today, it's a complex geometry, it's a complex geometry uh, project uh, where I'm aware um, I want to foster complex geometry in design. For particular reasons, like because we know that there are certain pot uh, potential, certain um, uh, performative uh, potential in complex geometry, um, but we know that um, that there are certain uh, um, that there is certain kind of usefulness in having a, a straight uh, wall, for instance, right, <laughs> or, or a, a certain proportion of a room. You know, like uh, we really like just from a health perspective, which is actually in group is also a central part is the, the, the health, uh, the experience of the user. And for instance, you have uh, knowledge on proportion. So you actually know what a good proportionate space is. Then you add the uh, dimension of um, uh, kind of passive ventilation. You don't want to add any mechanical ventilation. So you have a ratio of depth, for instance, that comes as a constraint. And layering all these kind of um, reasoning for um, for what you're doing. The, the I think 
it's a challenge, but also the chance to understand if there are any patterns and what are the patterns and where do you need the flexibility of adaptation. And uh, I think that that is, uh, yeah. And from my background also, again, coming um, to the project that I presented, like in Tessa, my learning in, in, in system design was that um, you don't need uh, every part to be different in order to create a, um, to create a complexity, but it's uh, you know it really depends what your constraints uh, what your constraints are, and I think that is what's so interesting about your approach and saying you want to you want to approach it from a process perspective where you standardize the skill or you say there's the skill and then you have the range of what you can do with the skill. Um, that I mean that's a really interesting and great approach. I would just wonder if you then not still have a certain, you have a scope that you can cover, but you have a constrained scope st uh, still. And I think that's, uh, that's also, I think, you know, in, in all this, what's so important about research is to understand um, ranges and understand freedom and understand constraints, especially if you set up frameworks and you always have constraints and you always serve for a particular um, purpose. Yeah. So, uh, very good question, very, really. Sorry. How many questions? Very, very good, long and uh, interesting uh, question. Um, and and I think what what uh, what I need, of course, to say is that um, that I the way that I need to explain this framework is in the sense of a certain antithesis to product product based approaches, right? But I think um, this is merely of a, of a certain. This is just necessary out of the uh, out of explaining how it's really different from a certain approach, right? It's not to say that uh, that a product based approach is not uh, suitable for a certain kind of building typology, right? Um, and I think there is a certain um, market, if you will, or a certain need. Uh, for example, what you're doing in Copius, right? Uh, where you have, let's say, um, uh, rentable housing units, right? That have a certain repetition in how they need to work, right? And, uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense to think about then the, the flat as a product, right? The end user um, kind of using this product and um, frankly, I'm a, uh, I agree with a lot of things that you're doing there. Um, but of course, I need to also say that um, that this is uh, this is limited at some point, right? Um, it's 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 going as like there is a certain need for just exactly the same uh, rooms all the time, right? For hotels, for example, right? It's like a known modular construction topology that a lot of companies are doing already. Not a lot of them are fully automated, but uh, they're building the same module like 100 times, 200 times, and they're having a, a very high productivity. Um, and then from, from this kind of fully standardized uh, product-based approach, of course, you have this kind of transition to more and more complex uh, situations, right? And um, I think the end user is very important to think about, but of course you also have a you have a building site that has a different soil condition. Uh, you might have a mayor that wants your building to be I don't know a certain should look a certain way or it should uh, include I don't know a kindergarten right because it's in the city and there on this kind of spot would be the perfect place for a kindergarten. So especially in urban city development, um, I think there is for one building, there are so many different uh, uh, constraints and restraints um, um, coming that, that um, the building system, if it's thought as, as a product um, or as a platform, uh, would, be, would need to answer so many different questions that really at that point, I guess it would be easier to just say like, okay, we, we understand, it's always gonna be a different kind of thing, right? 
Um, if we build in Heilbronn, there's this mayor and he wants this and that, uh, he or she, of course. Um, and if we, if we go, um, if we go to Stuttgart, it's more important to use beach plywood because uh, out of this and that reason, I mean, these are a bit of a stupid, uh, are, are a couple of stupid examples, right? But there's, there's so many different things going on that, um, that I think if we find a way of how to, um, how to get this kind of uh, organization, uh, um, if we, if we can accept this kind of organization for the majority of the, of the projects that we want to build as an industry, um, it's, it might be easier to develop the, the actual uh, automation technology um, into this organizational framework than changing the organizational framework altogether. Right? Because for a client and the end user, it's of course also not really understandable, especially if it's not like a one year rental flat, right? But let's say um, it's, it's the house of a family um, or the flat of a family that they want to uh, live for a long time, then I think they want to have a certain agency also to, to uh, design and to choose. And that is, of course, connected to a lot of uh, uh, cultural um, aspects and, uh, and different, different viewpoints of what their ideal uh, living scenario would look like. I think Another another very important thing to mention here um, is that um, that the way that I conceive this framework is actually it includes the possibility to do the same building system more often, right? Um, I, maybe I should show the slide again, but you have this kind of cascading um, sequence of more and more standards, standardization towards the middle, right? But you can use the same robots and the same building system for more than one project, right? And have it fairly similar. But uh, if you organize it in in the way that you that you um, um, keep your fabrication system reconfigurable, right? And your uh, software um, and your data infrastructure based on these kind of skills and tasks. Um, you would then have the possibility, right? For example, uh, maybe maybe at some point, Popius also wants to do office buildings, right? And you you want to develop a certain building system for this kind of office buildings, and um, but you want to use the same robots for that, right? Or you want to reuse all the all the thinking processes that you put into the automation of your of your uh, residential uh, building platform or building system, right? Then, then if you don't want to lock yourself in in a certain development, right? And you have you have a very good uh, building system for for a certain type of residential flats, then uh, then this this could gradually kind of transition, right? Uh, in 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 the framework of this kind of integrated coevolution, right? Which at the current moment, of course, is just a word, right? It's, it's just an idea. I also don't want to give the impression that we solved all the questions uh, that we that come from that, right? Because at the moment, if if I would need to go and start a company, I would not do project based automation. Right? I, I, I need to say that very clearly. I think this is this is really a very high, like a, a long term goal, which if if we if we all agree on. Right, that we want to achieve, it, it takes a lot of technological development to actually go there. Um, but, I, I, but yeah, I think, I think if we don't want to end up uh, with, um, with, uh, with architecture be, and our cities being constrained by the technology that builds them, uh, then we need, to, we need to embed this kind of flexibility and this this uh, ability to co-evolve already in the in the very beginning of the development, right? Otherwise, at some point, it's going to be ten times more expensive to have a special, uh, a specially designed building uh, uh, rather than using your your building out of a, uh, a catalog. And and the point, of course, being that. Uh, that then as also as an overall industry, um, 
the productivity is, is, is very, very high, but the effectiveness is very low, right? Because if, if I need a, again, a very stupid example, right? But if I need a, a well-suited 30 square meter flat, um, but then everything that I can get is uh, 40 square meters, then um, uh, the, the productivity can be 25% higher that it is still not going to be more effective in terms of suiting my needs, right? Again, a very, very stupid example because you may think about like having different kind of floor plans and sizes, but uh, but I think building in a way is, is also really like designing a building is like uh, planning a birthday party in some way, right? It, it's, you need to really understand whatever, like what the involved people want. Right, and <laughs> uh, and we we cannot have an app that plans your you your your birthday party, right? Because that app might not know that uh, I don't know your friend just wants to go into the cinema with uh, with his with his friends and want to have a beer afterwards, and that's the perfect birthday, right? The app might not know that, and it can't can't really know that because it's a it's a human information, right? We need to it's something that we need to talk about, and I think. The design of our cities is also something that we need to talk about. We need to have the agency to to uh, think about how we want to how we want to live and what what our cities should look like, right? Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, I can uh, jump in with one one uh, short question because we we uh, yeah we are close to uh, four now. Um, so, so my question is: It really? Um, I see this uh, both directions, like the, the product line, and uh, I mean a flexible product. I think it's not like uh, making uh, like this rectangle uh, houses, but uh, and on the other side, the uh, project-based approach. Um, what is if it's um, if it's it's if it's um, if there's not a hard line? Is it still then? This uh, you you talk about this McKinsey uh, McKinsey study where I think it's uh, thirteen percent they they gave to the to the modules and um, is it is it still true um, if it's yeah not a hard border in between so you have on the one hand you have uh, um, projects with uh, let's say uh, modules which could be a family of part I don't know. And uh, on the other hand, you have uh, like um, products which get so flexible that they become, um, you can make projects out of it. So I don't know if it's, <laughs> or is it at that time when you start to have, um, uh, have the project involved and you, uh, it's, it's already a, a project and it's not a product anymore. So I think if you look at the at the very fundamental nature of why do we actually build a building? How do we get the idea of building a building? It's it's because certain people come together and they want a building, right? Very, very simplified, right? But the the idea of building a building for a certain need comes out of a, out of a social context. Right? comes comes from a human a condition, if you will, that, uh, <laughs> that tells us, okay, we need a shelter, we need, I don't know, we, we want a certain thing, right? And you you can now say, like, okay, certain certain buildings that are being built are completely ridiculous and no one needs them, and, they, and they're so fantastic that, uh, that it's just a, a waste of money or something, right? But they, they still have a certain... Still, someone built them, right? Someone paid for them. Someone wanted them, right? And it's like at that point of thinking, it's I think always coming from a, from a, um, the the reason that we build and the reason why a certain project is realized is coming out of a out of this kind of almost a communicative communication layer, right? Where Certain people come together. Maybe it's 100. Maybe it's two. Maybe it's 1,000. Um, and they and they decide they want to build a building, right? Of course, embedded in like very complicated political, social systems, companies, whatever. But it always comes down to to the people who actually want to do that. And um, 
And I think technology needs to be a, an aid to actually achieve what we wanted, right? But what we want is not going to be decided by the technology, but it's going to be decided by the communication between us and where we, where we decide what we want. And it might well be that in, I don't know, in 10 years, we develop a new material that is way more efficient and sustainable than timber, right? Or I don't know what. And, um, and then everyone wants to deal with that material. And then our automation systems should not prohibit us to build with that better material, right? And it, that's, that's a very, I understand that's a very meta level question, right? But, but I think on a, on a very fundamental notion, that's, that's really important. Um, and it might even be that, that it's not a shift from, from timber to something else, but just from, from one timber species to another uh, might, might need completely different cross section, completely different processes. You might need a different tool, right? And then the question is, okay, can your robotic fabrication platform adjust to these different needs, right? And then you can, you can uh, cash in or you can make use of all the uh, benefits that you can arrive with using this more advanced material. But if, if, your, if your automation technology is not able to do that, then, then we're constrained. And I mean, the, Arguably, the reason why construction technology is so backwards and so conservative, in a, in a, in a sense, I think is, is very much connected, connected to the hardware investment, right? As soon as you invested in like 10 trucks to ship your concrete wherever you want, you don't want to change to uh, timber construction, right? You want to use the trucks that you bought and that you built. And the construction machinery that we build and design are very, very expensive, right? So, um, of course, it's, it's like a very long-term kind of transition that we, that we, that we can see in, in, the, in the current industry. And I think with, with timber construction kind of starting to really um, develop itself into a, I, I, I see it as, as the dominant kind of construction a sector in, in I, I guess, five, ten years, um, we really have the unique chance to, to have an agency and the understanding of how we embed certain uh, digital technologies in this hardware, right, in order to prevent that then we get stuck again, right? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Katrin, is it acceptable for you? Or... <laughs> At least, I, mean, uh, I think fundamentally we don't have a conflict here. Yeah, I think no, we no, don't, no, no. We I don't just agree. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's fine. <laughs> okay, then um, somebody else would uh, like to join. We have a real uh, like two strong uh, lecture speakers and also uh, um, talkers and discussion, um, yeah, involvers and. Is anybody else who wants to yeah. join the party? We, we, uh, join the party <laughs> because yeah, is there somebody? If if not, I I would say we we stop the party. And uh, uh, votes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Dr. Skorbastanos. I'm a mechanical engineer working for a simulation mm -hmm. software company in Zurich, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I come to this from a very different angle. I'm not an architect, I'm not, not a civil engineer, um, but I've been personally very intrigued by the topic. And um, I wanted to ask um, Hans Jakob on, on your slide of co-design um, that you showed, um, there's really, you know, you have like a master model that can do lots of things. It's like a, your base model is there for detailing, it's there for the structural analysis, and you derive your fabrication model from that. And I wanted to hear how you envisage that working um, with multiple people and multiple companies. You know, could one person, one designer, formulate the shape and do the structural analysis, maybe optimize it, and generate the machine code at the same time? Or do you see it like being shared across specialisms? Um, 
A very, very good and important question as well. And uh, I'm going to try to to answer my my understanding or my point of view on, on this question. I think I think so. What we for for quite a long time we or our field in computational design uh, and also in digital fabrication we try to. Um, completely automate the design process, right? So we said, okay, there is a certain optimal solution to a certain design question, and we can just use the computer and the processing power to simulate a lot of options or to generate a fairly optimal solution completely automatically, right? And I mean, at ICD, we're, we're arguably experts on this, on really using the computer to generate geometries that, that are not designed in, like, in the sense of hand-drawn or like with, with an agency in every aspect, but really generate it. Um, but, um, but really in the last years, um, I think we all realized that, uh, that, uh, that our own need to have an agency and a say uh, into how the structure looks like demands the tools to become interactive, right? And that, of course, then becomes the real, uh, the really tricky aspect in terms of the, the software, right? If I think it's way easier to build a software that generates a good or optimal solution uh, rather than a software that is able to interact with a lot of people, a lot of designers, and uh, and uh, is able to ingest all the information that the designers um, want to give, right? And with designers, I include the structural engineer um, and any any other kind of uh, designing party. And I definitely think that uh, um, the way that we design buildings will will need a certain um, specialist uh, eye on it, right? So I think. The structural engineer will always be necessary, right? But I think the the software that we use and the the interfacing and the interoperability between those softwares needs to become so smooth, right? That we can that we can basically um, integrate a lot of uh, a lot of those um, uh, disciplinary components into into an overall design model. Even if we build it up from scratch, right? I'm not sure if I, if it's, this is really understandable what I mean, but uh, but but I think this this kind of interoperability becomes then, of course, the major question. Yeah, because I, I guess I mean the worst case scenario in your co-design workflow would be that um, you design the structure and do the structural analysis, and then the company who has the robot then redraws the same structure because they can't read the model or there's no direct link. And yeah, so this, is, this is, I think, the, the main hypothesis that we try to bring into the design of the structure, the logic of thinking in tasks, right? Instead of thinking, okay, I need a beam here and it needs to be a stiff, stiff connection on the right side and I don't know, a different kind of connection on the other side. I think the model that I'm proposing is forcing the designers to really think not only in how that structure looks like and how that structure behaves structurally, but also how it's actually produced, right? And instead of printing a sheet of paper with, with the floor plan, giving it to a construction specialist and that specialist trying to understand now how to build it, um, if we include the generation of tasks into the into the design model, right? First, we can simulate the procedure of fabrication, but also we can just very quickly send our task lists to the specialists and they give us the feedback, okay, I can make it, I can make it, this I cannot make, right? Or I can make it, but I need to order a big machine for it and it might cost more, right? Um, and this, of course, right now is just, a, again, it's, it's just an idea, but uh, but I think this is, this is a possibility um, uh, where we could go to. 
Cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for your input. I, um, I also think from my background that uh, yeah, the tools that you use shouldn't be constraining your design process. I think this is like a very you know important mantra in all of this. Anyway, thank you for answering the question. Thanks for the question. Okay, yeah, thanks again for the question. Any more questions? I think first people are leaving, so we are good on time to stop the party if nobody has any question anymore. And yeah, thanks uh, again for the speakers. I think we had great speakers today. For that, we had a very small audience here. So sorry for the speakers uh, for that, but um, I think it doesn't mean, um, I think the quality was great. And uh, it's not, it's, I think I learned this in the cluster in the first time um, that it's more about quality than about quantity. So in this sense, I would like to close and uh, yeah. Thank you both and all that were coming and have a nice weekend and uh, hopefully everything is working next week with the LCIL. I think we were a bit in a, in a hurry now and uh, yeah, thanks. I also have to clap one more time and then uh, yeah. Thank you and have a good Thank weekend and goodbye. Thank you more for the yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 B